right. All right. So please let's make sure our phones are muted. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Marietta Theodorus. I'm a highly effective educator. I've been teaching students from grades six through 12 for about 10 plus years now. Also, I've worked in nonprofits as well as um, in athletics. Um, today, we're going to talk about mentorship, student mentorship. Um, we're going to get started really quickly. There you go. Let's get started. Present, present, present. Okay, we're just waiting for this thing to do this thing. Got to be patient with technology. Okay. So the title of my talk is, I don't like students. And I noticed my alarm, some of you, but I'm going to explain and walk you through the whole concept and principle of why I don't like students. And I don't believe that teachers should like students. This is an educator's guide on how you can establish and maintain effective relationships with your students, okay? So let's get right into it. So most educators know that we are evaluated on the Marzano um, domains and yearly educators are deemed highly effective by being evaluated on their ability to establish and maintain relationships with students. But how can this be achieved with, when you have 120 plus students, especially in the times that we're living in when we're social distancing and we're doing homeschool, how do you maintain a relationship that you can't physically see a student or a parent or, or they can't see you? How do you maintain that relationship? Well, it's really, really, really simple. It's really, really simple. And I'm going to explain. So everybody thinks that you're supposed to like your students. I always hear it all the time for my students or parents, wait, aren't teachers supposed to like their students? And I always say it's nice if you do, but you don't have to like your students. Liking students is not an educator's contractual obligation. It's nice, but it's not something that you're obligated to. If you look at Webster's Dictionary definition of like, like means to have a preference. And so like is based on a personal preference or a condition that's constantly changing. So students, I believe, should be treated unconditionally, regardless of any preference of that teacher. So if your model is, I like all my students, then there's going to be some students that don't fit in your preferences and you might not like them. And that truly can affect how you treat them and how you teach them. So just to give you guys a example of how I introduce myself to my students in the beginning of the year, also how I introduce myself to parents, my introduction is as follows. Hello, I'm Ms. Theodorus. Let's take this off the table. No, I don't like you. You're 12, I'm 36. We're not hanging out after school. I like adults. Those are my, my friends. Those are the people I like. And when I say this, the kids are completely thrown off. They really, really have the same reaction. That's not fair. You should like your teacher. Their mouths are usually, oh, I mean, you should like us, you're a teacher, and their mouths are usually hanging open. And then I begin to explain, I've been, I begin to explain to them what fairness is and what like is. So I say, in my class, you will learn to be treated. You will learn, you will be treated fairly. Um, and most importantly, you will always be safe. Now, would you rather me like you or would you rather learn, be treated fairly and be safe? And typically the kids, um, you can see the light bulb go off in their head and they pick treated fairly, be safe, learn. So the question then after that, that I get from students and parents, because you have to be, you have to imagine that parents have never heard anything like this. It really sounds unethical for me to say that I don't like students and I'm a teacher. 
right? Um, so the question is usually, if you don't like your students, then how do you build a relationship? That is what we have to think about and go, and I'm gonna walk you through, how do I build a relationship with my students? How can I be a highly effective uh, teacher? Building relationships with students when I don't like them. And it's really, really simple. I don't look at myself as a teacher. I look at myself as a mentor. If you can look on the screen on the right, you see that the, um, the acronym for teacher, the word mentor fits in, inspire, educate, coach, share, influence, encourage, all those attributes are what I embody. I encourage every educator to inspire, to educate, to coach, to share, to influence, to encourage their students. And all that falls under the umbrella of mentor. So none of this has to do with like. You might like pepperoni pizza. Your student might like uh, sausage pizza. And just by that, then you're not in the same preference. You're not liking the same thing. So all these words, all these attributes, inspire, share, influence, encourage, it's indivisible. I'm treating this child um, indivisibly, uniquely as a child that I'm mentoring. I think, think about it that way. I don't just go in to teach a lesson, teach from bell to bell and say, okay, great, um, I did my job. I think about how I'm going to inspire them. I think about what I'm sharing with them uniquely. So the definition from Western Dictionary of mentor is a trusted advisor. It's very, very key, key and critical. A mentor is a trusted advisor um, because we are the ones navigating students through the highs and lows of life by using their own life experiences, by our own life experiences, excuse me, our own wisdom and our resources. That's what we are for these students. My rubric, my foundation, for mentoring my students is the word care, C-A-R-E. And the word consistency, compassion, exposure, and honesty are my foundational um, words that I live by. They're like my pillars for how I mentor students. And this way, being consistent, being compassionate, being um, giving them exposure to the things in life that they're going to need, being honest with them, that doesn't take any extra time at all for me. None. It doesn't take any extra time. I'm doing this in the cracks of my day. I'm being mindful of the fact that I need to be compassionate. I need to be consistent. I'm always exposing them. I'm always honest with love to them. So this is very, very simple to follow. And I'm going to walk you through how I do it even more. Care again, another definition. It's not hard. You're not caring as an educator in the same manner that a parent would, but you are caring um, in a supervisory way, similar to what a doctor um, does with his or her patients. You're giving that special attentiveness to that student and care by West Traditionary means to give care or to supervise. And you can care in the sense of, you can supervise in the sense of you're in the same room with your student or you can go that extra mile and be like a doctor who has phenomenal bedside manner because we know that all doctors are, are not um, doctoring the same. In the same measure, all teachers are not teaching the same. And the difference is small but major is the care that you give your patient or in this case, your student. So care is the foundation. The first step of care is consistency. So educators care by being consistent. Be consistent in, in a positive mood. This is very, very important. Students will know what to expect and conform to your mood. In my classes every day, I, I tell the students in the beginning of the year that they will never know what's going on in my life. They will never be able to look at me and tell if I'm having a good day or a bad day. I'm always even killed. And I try to be high with them because they're tired. They probably had a diet full of sugar. So now they're headed down. There's other issues in their life that I'm not aware about. So I always want to be the anchor for them. When they come to my class, they know Miss Theodore's is going to be upbeat. She's going to be um, kind. She's going to have great expectations. We're going to learn. And I'm not up and down because they're growing. They're learning. Their frontal lobe is still developing. So their emotions are probably um, um, erratic and their life circumstances are not completely in their hands. So when they come to my class, I'm steady. They know what they're going to get when they come to me. So consistency is very important, specifically in your mood. I'm never the teacher that today is not the day teacher. 
So I remember when I was in high school and middle school that you would come into class before the bell would even ring. Um, the teacher would say, oh, y'all sit down. Today's not the day. Don't bother me. We're just going to do this. Do your work. I'm never that teacher. I remember how that felt. I promised myself I would never be that teacher that because of whatever's going on in my day, now I have to project that on my students. So my mood is consistent. Um, next, you take an interest in students' personalities, interests, and hobbies. So for example, Steve, how the SEC me com um, competition goes Saturday? And then I would continue to listen to his answer and I say, oh, oh no, you'll get, you'll get them next time if they didn't do so well. So just a simple 30 second, 15 second transaction but that child taking an interest in Steve, who might be an introvert, who might not raise his hand in class, who might not get all of my attention, I'm taking a, a interest in what he does. Even if I'm not teaching science, I'm not teaching in engineering, me taking an interest in what he cares about builds that relationship. And I'm doing that consistently. Um, keep your word. This is very important. Have integrity. So I said, let your yes be yes, your no be no. Students are often, as an educator, as you're building a relationship, they want you to show up for them. So they're going to ask you to come to their game. They're going to ask you to come to their recital. They're going to ask you to come to uh, their, 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 their competition that may be off campus. And I say yes to some, and I don't, say, I don't say yes to everything, but I have it in my head already planned. Hey, I'm staying late, tutoring. I'm going to make sure after tutoring's over, I'm going to stick my head in the door and look at the volleyball team. I make sure that a student sees me or even if they don't see me, I make sure that the next day I'm talking to them about what I saw, engaging them because I want them to know that I'm giving them so much support. For me, having educators show up when I was in high school, I played basketball and that was a phenomenal experience for me that took me really far in life. And I always remember how I felt when my math teacher came or my PE teacher came and showed up and they made a comment in class about how well I did or what they felt about the team. It makes you feel it makes you feel as a student like your teacher really does care about you besides the grade that you're getting. Um, they, it care, you care about them as a whole person. Now, if you have kids, you have a spouse, you have other things in life. You can't go to everything, but there's some things that you can stick your head in the door for 10 minutes or you can make mention of it. And it really means the world to those students. They never forget it. I say that consistency builds trust and security. And that's very, very important. from my mentorship group, I have students that I've been blessed to mentor for over 10 years. Um, you're going to see a clip from Elijah Brown. He is a Bill Gates scholar. I taught him when I was teaching 12th grade honors English, and it's been a privilege of my life to know a young man such as himself. Um, and you would think because of his high academics, he doesn't need any additional support, but all students need the support of their educators because we bring another element to their life. And he's going to give his perspective on how he knew when teachers cared. Let's go back. There we go. Let's click. You could always tell uh, when a teacher cared, honestly like when they paid attention to the students, like people, and it's interesting yeah. how teachers think that, but like kids really do pay attention. I think that was mentioned last time as well, but paying attention to not only, like typically how I look at is consistency. You wanna look for a shift of consistency in your students. And the only way you can do that is if you pay attention to them in the first place. Can so, you can you give us some characteristics of how you identify that a teacher cared? Like some one thing, that made you say, I know this teacher cared and this is how I know. Um, I mean, I, other, other than their like natural expressions and enthusiasm that came from them speaking, but it was also them like helping you through stuff. Cause like some teachers you answer a question and they're just like, no, that's wrong. And then they move on. Other teachers who really want you to learn, they will show you the right answer and then if you come with questions later, they're more than happy to like walk you through what you're missing. So like showing interest in your learning process and not just kind of like Marie said, just feeding you information. Like okay. you're facilitating learning. You're not just out there to throw knowledge at somebody. So 
Okay. All right. Elijah expressed himself really well. So he further um, validated one of my pillars, which is to care for students, to mentor for students, is to be consistent with them. And it's just a little bit extra that makes a difference. Step number two, care step number two is compassion. Educators, educators can care by being compassionate. So no judgment, no prejudice, no condemning. So don't be the get off my lawn educator. Understand and accept that this generation is not your generation. Social media is their socialization. They were born in a world of technology. Some of them have had a smartphone since they've been five. And so that is how they communicate the best. And as adults, we look at the kids, we dismiss the kids, we judge them and say, oh, you guys, you don't talk to each other. All you do is get on your phone. All you do is um, get on your video games. And that is very true. This is how they're communicating. Nobody's sending smoke signals anymore. Nobody's sending Morse code anymore. And what I tell um, parents and teachers is you have to remember that the generation before you said the same thing to you. Oh, all you want to do is watch those VHS cassettes. Or if you knew your schoolwork the way you knew this rap, you would be a straight A student. And the bottom line is every generation is, is pointing their finger and wagging their finger judgmentally at the generation behind them. And you have to tap in and remember that once upon a time, there was an adult that said that to you. And it's not that they were wrong, but it was that they were definitely um, being judgmental and it didn't make you feel good. So when you accept the fact that, yeah, this is not my generation, this is how these kids communicate. Um, this is the apple from the, our own tree. We have created this quote participation um, trophy uh, generation that everybody snars out, but we created this. So I don't condemn the kids because I understand that they're the apple and we're the tree. And I focus on how, if I'm concerned about their socialization, I focus on how I can best help them to socialize in front of people, how to look people in the eye, how to have a strong handshake, I actually coach them through that because they're not going to learn that through osmosis. Everybody's judging them for what they can't do. How many people are really taking the time to teach them what they need um, to do rather. Um, the next point is they do have problems. I hear a lot of adults say this to their child or their student a lot. What's the problem? You don't have problems. And it always makes my skin crawl because these students do have problems. They're not your problems. They don't have a mortgage. They don't have a marriage. They don't have a kid probably. Um, they don't have those issues. But the bottom line is they have issues that they're dealing with that we never even thought of. Kids are dealing with cyberbullying. That's a real issue. Teen suicide is on the rise. School shooting unfortunately the last couple of years has become a regular thing so much so we now do school shooting drills that wasn't something I did when I was in school that is something that as an educator I walk my students through we don't just do fire drills anymore we do school shooting drills okay so that that's another level of anxiety that these kids have to deal with that we don't sex trafficking is on the rise these are things that the kids are aware of because they have friends that are walking home and that don't come back these are things that really affect the kids on top of whatever else they're going that's going on. This is the difference between our generation and their generation. So don't be dismissive. Don't be prejudiced and say, oh, well, you don't have any problems. They're dealing with things that they can't articulate and they don't understand. It's not their fault. It wasn't their doing, but this is the reality of where we are. So these stressors in this generation that they're dealing with are things we never thought about. Your classroom should be a safe place. That's very, very important to me. Um, part of being compassionate is that I'm not judging students. I'm dealing with kids who have a whole nother lifestyle. Um, currently, recently, a few months ago, a young lady that I coached 10 years ago found me on Facebook. She's since moved many states away and she is now transgender. And she sent me a DM. I had no idea who she was. And she said, my mom and my my mom and I talk about you all the time. I'm so glad I found you on Facebook. When you come to New York, can you please go to dinner with me? And I was like, absolutely. And we went back and forth. And all she kept talking about was how good I made her feel as a as a player of mine. I only coached her one year, and she lives a very, very private life. 
Um, you can imagine she doesn't see a lot of people that she used to. You can imagine. And here she is, 24 years old. I have not seen her since she was 14. And she's reaching out to me, finding me on Facebook. So I'm really excited to meet with her. But it really touched me because she sought me out and she feels safe with me to see her even at this portion of her life. That meant the world to me that assured me that I, I did something right even back then. So you should always be a safe place for your students as well as your classroom, no matter what their religion, their creed, their belief system, their family life. You don't have to say that. You should be that for those students. So compassion is a very critical pillar. Here is um, another one of my sweethearts. She's going to talk about the judgment of adults. She is a Rutgers University scholar, scholarship track runner. She's a phenomenal um, athlete, and she's going to talk about the judgment she feels from adults regarding some of the things that she goes through. And I wish she would play right. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. We're going to work on it. We're going to work on it. Come on, technology, work right. I hope this is it. I think this is it. I think this is it. Okay. Yeah, based on the topic of like the older generation is not really understanding this, I feel like that is like they always feel like they could criticize our generation of like based off what how they are. Like you don't really understand our perspective. Like let me say an example. So my mom is always like, you guys don't call each other. All you guys do is text. It's like, do you know what FaceTime is, though? Like, she's like, you guys never really see each other or have actual conversation. You guys just use text, DMs, and all that. I'm like, but we FaceTime. So that's like, she's like, so I tell her, I'm like, oh, I spoke to um, one of my friends today. She's like, do you guys actually speak or you just text it? I'm like, we swear. It's not just to have to call. We have like, we're doing more than you guys, actually. We're actually seeing each other rather than just hearing our voices. So if you don't really know about something, you can't really say that because they don't know, but they always want to criticize. But that's all I have to really say. All right. Next slide. And here is my adopted daughter. She's a former player of mine, but I call her, and at this point, she's an adopted daughter of mine. She's continuing the same conversation regarding the judgment of adults with technology. And it won't act right. All right, technology. <laughs> I need a kid to show me how to work this technology. It just won't play. Let's see. The stuff that we have now, they didn't have back then. So I also feel like that also plays a major like a major part into that because like we have cell phones yeah but back then y'all didn't use cell phones the way that we use cell phones like look at us now look at the time we're in now we need our cell phones like we're actually now you now you need me when i was using my phone it was a problem but now it's um, how you do this now, now right you show me how to get church on facebook live oh but when I yes. was, it was a problem how do i like, hook up the wi-fi like all them like <laughs> <it's a crib. laughs> and they be the main one and they be the main one to tell us oh like don't wait to do what you love follow your dream how i'm gonna follow my dream but now you mad that i'm following my dream come on now how that works so as you can see my students are very expressive, <laughs> but there's a lot of truth to everything they said, a lot of prejudice, a lot of judgment. And we as the older generation and specifically educators, we can be one less judgmental person in their life and understand that their generation is their own special niche. And we we support each other, quite frankly. So st care step number three is exposure. This is so important. This is life changing as um, educators demonstrate care by by exposing um, their by exposing their students to different things. So um, once an educator notices a student's unique talent, hobby, or interest, you can use your influence with them to direct them to pursue it. So, for example, if I have a student that's really into the stars, I will share with them NASA internet websites. I inform them about free cheerleading camp if that's what they're into and I see like they're a good dancer. Um, I connect them with local college prep programs. All my students that I believe are, um, are pursuing college or should if they haven't even thought about it. I have that question. I have that conversation with my students all the time. I'm very aware of the fact that 
Um, every child will not go to college. And I let them know that, hey, you don't need to go to college to be successful. You'll be successful um, in your in your life's purpose, in your gifts and in your talents. But for the vast majority, of course, I'm an educator and I guide them in the direction of, of academia because it's going to be um, a great asset in their life. So I give them options. I don't condemn them if they don't want to go to college. Maybe one day they will. I just want them to know that they are more than capable of going. So I connect them with college prep programs. We have Upward Bound here in Palm Beach County. I always connect my students with that program because a free program that prepares them for college and in your area, you can find out which programs locally do that for your students as well. So expose them to other things. Look at their gifts and their talents. This is very important because educators oftentimes are the first to notice a child's unique talent. So for instance, Beyonce, when she was five, her teacher was the first one to tell her parents, hey, you know, your daughter can really sing. And the parents dismissed it. Her mother was like, yeah, she homes and sings around the house all the time. And the teacher stopped and said, no, she can really sing. I'm going to put her in a talent show. And she blew them away. Same thing happened with Michael Jackson. It was originally Jackson 4. His dad said he was too young to be in it. His teacher gave him an opportunity. He performed at the talent show, blew them away. And now today, those two people I'm referring to are considered the best um, musical artists of our time, arguably. You know, and it's the teacher that highlighted that to a parent. So when you're an educator and you see that twinkle in that kid's eye, you see something that they do unique, don't dismiss it because everybody's dismissing it. And this talent can really change the world and it will change the life of that child because you're helping guide them in a, on a path that really is like their gift and it comes natural to them. So exposure is important and paying attention to the gifts and talents of your students is, is super important. So here's just an example. These are screenshots of my Instagram teacher page. I created a teacher page probably three years ago because I realized that um, most of my students were on social media. Um, all of my colleagues thought it was a bad idea. Uh, my administration wasn't keen on it, but the parents and the students loved it. And I used it as a way for one, the kids to contact me directly without me having to give them my personal information. Also, I post and I record the, the, the successes of these students because my current students are looking at my social media page and they can see, um, it gives me validation. They can see how I'm walking a child through life. So if you look to the left, the picture on the left is a screenshot of one of my sweeties. Her name is Shirley Russo. She has a phenomenal story. She came here after the earthquake in Haiti in 2010. And when I got her, it was only her fourth year in this country. She was a phenomenal student. I pushed her and helped her um, get scholarships and do applications for college. So she got a great scholarship at the University of Central Florida. And you can see in this uh, picture here in the corner, the bottom right of that picture, that's a picture of me taking her to freshman orientation. Her parents both worked two jobs. They were not able to take her. She's a first generation college student in her family. And she was crying and she said, hey, if I don't go to this, I can't go to college. I did all this work. And I said, I'm definitely taking you. Now, is that something that a teacher should do for liability reasons? No, I had to talk to her parents. And I just couldn't rest with the fact um, that she did all this work. She learned the language. She was in honors classes. She got this huge scholarship from this huge, great college. And she was going to miss out on a great opportunity because of one orientation. So that was a gamble that was worth it to me. Some people see it as a gamble. I do not. I did not tell the administration I was doing that. I didn't want anybody to stop me. It was the end of the year. And I said, hey, technically not my student anymore in two weeks. And I took her. And, and um, if you look in the picture, you see her with her cap on her head. And me and her a few years later outside the UCF uh, mascot statue when she graduated. In the middle, if you remember my student Marie, this is me and her doing some personal development. You can't see the picture as well, but she is reading a book that I bought her. It's called The Battlefield of the Mind. And it's the book that I gave her so that she could work on her personal development and work on her uh, focus for high school. She's now in college doing well. Also on that page, I highlight kids because kids go home and say, hey, I did nothing today. But the parents who follow me, they can see their kids getting awards or going through their day. And the parents always like that. So 
Um, I'm exposing them. But I'm also recording what's going on. Um, step number four, honesty, honesty. So this is real straightforward for me. Educators demonstrate care by being honest, <laughs> by being honest. Um, an ounce of cure is better, is better than a pound of prevention. Okay. I'm going to say it again. An ounce of cure is better than a pound of prevention. So I would rather tell someone up front where their error is or give them a warning about what it looks like is going to happen. Because if they go into a place where they create, they make an error or, you know, there's some kind of unfortunate circumstances because of negligence. It's very hard to fix it after you've already gone to that point. It's very difficult, very difficult. So i rather be up front with you, tell you the whole truth, and then give you and empower you to make the right decisions for your life. Um, a lot of people would not go down the negative paths they went down if more people were honest. Um, I think teachers have a lot are really leery about being honest with their students because they don't want any liability. And that is true. That's a real thing. But students specifically come to me because they know I'm not going to lie to them. I tell them that I'm like, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to give you the truth and love. So it says here, students can sense when they are being deceived. Tell them the truth with love. I think about it, I think about what I'm saying. And even though I say things um, in love, I still get the backlash of that was too harsh. You uh, Or they say, Miss Theodore, you just coming from my whole life right now. And for the ones that mature, they appreciate it, they respect it, and it usually takes some time. But because I'm consistent and I have not changed, they know I'm not lying to them, they know I want, want the best to, for them, they take it, they take it well in the end, it probably takes half the year for them to mature to that point, but I never lie to them. I tell them the truth and love and honesty is a very important pillar of care. So student mentee testimonials. I'm actually very honored today. I have a testimonial um, for you guys here with one of my um, mentees. She's actually with us. Let me see if I can get her in here. See if I can get her in here. Um, Y'all bear with me with the technology part. All right, here we go. Look like we in here. All right, so one of my mentees is on. She's gonna give you her testimony. I've been her mentor since she was in seventh grade. And now she's a sophomore in college. Her name is Marie LeBron. Um, she started off my basketball player and um, it's just been a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful walk um, that she and I have been a part of. I will say this if I can't say anything else. You don't actually pick your kids to be your mentees. They pick you. It has to happen holistically. I offer myself up to all kids. I say the same thing in the beginning of the year. And the kids that are attracted to me are attracted to me. The parents that, that trust their kids with me instinctively they do and I take it very seriously and with Marie right out the gate her mom was like here take her <laughs> and I was like no we don't have to do that but um I knew that I had a responsibility with her um it's been such a beautiful journey so that's why I call her my adopted child because you know you have a kid from the time they're 12 till now you, you feel like a mom and we've gone through those ups and downs so without any further ado Marie un unmute your mic and uh, introduce yourself even further to everyone. Oh my God. Sorry. Okay, she is doing something. I don't know what she's doing. What's going on, sweetie? I'm back. Okay, you're back. Hello, right. everyone. As she said before, my name is Marie LeBron. Nice to meet you guys. Y'all, yeah, don't worry, is this my daughter? My adopted daughter running around. Sorry. That's untamable. I'm sorry. People with kids understand. Marie? Sorry. Okay. Marie, you want to go ahead and give your testimony, please? Yeah. So, right. Miss Theodorus and I met when I was like 12, 11, seventh grade. 12. Ever since seventh grade, we've been like this. And it started off like this because I was a wild child. But she got me together. She really brought me together. She was real consistent 
real consistent, always asking me what am I going to do, what's my next plan, what's the goal. She always taught me to keep moving forward and always look for the bigger picture, think think outside the box, you know. So that's one thing. Another thing she always taught me is compassion because I didn't have any compassion back in middle school. I was ruthless. And she really taught me compassion. And she was very compassionate with me, very compassionate with me. Um, it was just a safe haven to be with her. So I always felt comfortable coming to her about my problems. She was always be there, be very open, talk to me. It was very honest with me, always kept it 100, always tell, like, you know, always give me her whatever you know, she went through, she would tell me, and, like, she would install, like, real, she would just install a lot of things into me, and I just really appreciate her, and without her, I could honestly say that I wouldn't be who I am today, because she really exposed me to, my eighth grade year, she took me to a TED Talk, my very first TED Talk, very first time in Orlando, never been to Orlando, she took me there, and it was just really an eye opener. And ever since then, that wild kid that I was just snapped out of me. It's still a part of me, but it doesn't always take control. And yeah, I can honestly say that. Very, I love Miss Theater. I love you. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you, sweetie. Um, I will. Um... Let's talk about, I think, one of our hardest, the hardest parts of our relationship that I think potentially could have broken up our, our relationship, Marie. Um, my honesty. Yes. You want to explain Very. how that was for you? You adjusting to that? I'm going to relocate. Okay, we're waiting on you. Oh, Marie, you can walk and talk though, sweetie, because we are recording. So, um, honesty was really one thing. I couldn't take her honesty. I thought she was joking when she would tell me the truth. I'm like, bro, stop playing. She'll be like, no, Marie, I, I really mean stop. I don't like your friends. And that would really hurt my feelings when she would say she did not like my friends. Like, what you mean you don't like my friends? And that was something I really couldn't handle. Her telling me, like, my friends ain't no good to me. Like, why am I hanging out with them? Like, they're bums. She'll tell my friends bums. And I hated that. I hated that. I'm like, my friends are not bums. Like, stop calling them up. And then she'll be like, don't bring them around me. And I was like, okay, I won't bring you to your class no more. And then that's Tell them what happened when you stop being friends with them. I became a better me. Thank you, Marie. I appreciate that. What she's not saying, the way she used to say it to me was, Coach, you just rip people's souls out. That's what she used to say and to me. And put salt on it. <laughs> Look at you. Put salt on it. Literally. It's like you have an open wound already, and she's already putting some more salt. Like, why are you doing that? <laughs> but that was honesty. I needed to hear it. Okay. I'm glad. I'm glad. Marie, uh, Marie has come a mighty long way. I don't have a problem telling you because she hasn't said it. When I met Marie, she was a fighter. Small. Marie is every bit of 5'1", and she was smaller then in seventh grade. And I was like, you got anger management issues. What the heck? To the point I didn't even, I was questioning whether she could even be on my team, but she was so sweet and she was working so hard to be on the team. I said, God dang it. She came to every, every training I did. And she, you know, just wide eyed and she was eager to learn. And I knew I couldn't coach that. I knew that I said, I got to let her get on this team because she had another gear that I saw. And then, um, you know, I'm able to decipher the anger and understand that whenever somebody's fighting a lot, they have a lot of rage, they have a lot of hurt. So then I take it upon myself to see if I can help them decipher where the hurt is, where the rage is, and to get something called self-control. That's hard to do with a seventh grader. But Marie was so eager. She was just a sponge. Everything I said, even though I didn't realize how much it was hurting her. I, it took her until like, she was 10th grade to tell me how much it hurt her feelings. But as um, people know, I, I feel nothing. I really do. 
I, I don't because I know right is right and I, I don't feel anything. I was just like, okay, that's good. And what's, what are we going to work on going forward? So I would actually walk her through what her steps should be. And so as time went on, things would happen with those same friends and she'd be like, coach, you were right. This is what happened. It might take a year. It might take three years. And she would come back and tell me. And I always told her, I'm not trying to be right. I want her to be right. I'm not trying to win a battle with her. I want her life to be right. And so the relationship continued to build. And we went through that for some years. It got better. So thank you, Marie, so much for sharing your testimony. All right, you guys, we're going to go back into the last few slides. I only have a few more to go. Thank you so much, sweetie. I appreciate you. You know, back into the slides. All right, technology, back right. All right, so here we are. So Marie was our first testimony. Our second testimonial is a young lady named Aquila, and she went to my church. Um, like I said, these relationships build, um, holistically. I don't pursue kids, um, to be my mentee. I don't even think about it that way. I'm just being a good person to them. That's how I look at it. But years go by and they're asking you for your advice. And the next thing you know, you're in a mentee mentor relationship. So Aquila just recently graduated from Howard university in Washington, DC. So this is her first year, um, as a post-grad. And we still are maintaining a great relationship. And you'll see the video from her where she talks about our relationship and what, what it really meant to her because it's a beautiful thing when kids can express themselves. It wasn't you taking me to dinner for me. For me, it was at my trunk party. You gave me this book um, and you wrote like this really sweet message in it um, oh, yeah. before I went off to college. And I like, I never wrote in the book because like I, I cherished it so much because oh. of your message in it. Yeah. And I, and I just, I still have it. It's somewhere, I don't it's stored somewhere. But for me, that's what my connection was for you. Like you just, you just gave me a book, a book that I could write in. Nothing oh, else. Sure. No, you I'm just sure. sending me off no. to college when we had first met. And that was like the reason why I had maintained, sure. yeah, maintained with you because it, that was the gesture for me. You know what I mean? Like, that was that. Like, that was, like, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, and I felt bad I couldn't go to your party party, so I remember that. But I remember that. I don't even remember you not being at my party. Wow. Wow. I remember your gift. Maya Angelou says people, what, they don't remember uh, what you do, but they remember how you made them feel. All right. All right. So, um... Yeah, that was really tough. <laughs> I'm going to go back into the presentation, you guys. Just hold, bear with me. It's going to take its time. So um, Aquila never told me that story. I never knew um, why she still stayed in contact with me. Uh, like I said, I'm in the life of these young people as long as they allow me to be. I don't force myself on them. And so when she said that, you know, I didn't even remember that I gave her that journal, but she did. And that meant a lot. So, so why do we do as educators what we do? And simples, because in the end, it's all worth it. We're in the life of these children for a set amount of time. And we have this window of opportunity to change the trajectory of their life. We're with these kids eight hours a day sometimes, sometimes longer if you're coaching and doing clubs. And in the end, it's worth it. I think we forget about what it's about on a day to day. And so I'm going to show you a clip of why we as educators mentor and why we do what we do. Hey, Jordan, I graduated! I love you, Dean Jordan! Bye, Miss Bell! Thank you. I'm always seeing you, Miss Memphis. Love you, man. Love you too. Oh. <sighs> so proud of you, Dr. Trey. Thank you, Dr. Fight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Mama. You did good. You did good. I got two more for you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Miss 
Gleason, I graduated! Miss Gleason! Miss Gleason, I got it! I love you too, I got it! I got it! Um, as somebody who was fortunate to teach on the high school level, watching those kids cross the threshold of going from being in high school and going into the real world and then graduating, a lot of people act like it's not a big deal uh, graduating from high school. But I've been blessed to still continue to teach kids who are the first generation of their family to get a high school diploma much less go to college and get an advanced degree. And so as educators, we need to be reminded about why do we do what we do? When you teach sixth grade, I think it's hard to see the end in sight, but as a teacher that also mentors and who cares very dearly for her students, I'm always thinking about the end. I'm always thinking about the next step for that child. And that keeps you going, that keeps you going. Um, here is, um, Another one of my students, again, Elijah Brown, giving his um, two cents to educators and his perspective about uh, the teacher-student relationship. And hopefully, oh, they won't play, y'all. Hold on. Sorry, y'all. Technology issues. Not my fault. This is why we need the young ones. So for teachers, for teachers, it's like, remember who you were. Like, remember that you were a student. Remember that you sat in desks. Remember that you sat in those classrooms. And even if you have to do it before you start the class, think back to that time in high school where you felt great and think back to that time in high school where you felt crappy. And remember, for one, that the fact that you remember in the first place. Like, that's how long it stuck with you. That's how much it and so you can either be the teacher that made that great impact on a student, or you could be the one that traumatized that student. And you don't even know sometimes the impact that you can have by the smallest things, which is why I'm glad that we mentioned those small details. But don't forget that you were a student. Don't forget that you had those experiences and that you wish somebody believed in you, that you wish someone spoke life into you, that you wish somebody gave you criticism from a place of love and encouragement and not like malicious intent. Just mm -hmm. don't forget what you used to be and how you wish someone was there to guide you into the person that you are now. Like, this is your opportunity to be better than the people you had around you when you were a kid. Mm -hmm. So Come take on, it just as seriously as you, just, as you wish someone did when you were little, when you were in high school. When everything was riding on those few years and you were scared and didn't know what you were going to do, like, remember that. So, yeah. Wow. Right. Wise words from a very young man. <clears throat> so that's wrapping up. I wanted to end the presentation on that note. I think nobody can better express to you what they need um, than a youth. Uh, Elijah is now his first year getting his master's and he can express best because he remembers so clearly how he felt just four or five years ago and the help that he needed from educators. And so just to um, give you guys some contact information on me, um, again, I'm Mary Theodorus. I'm a child advocate, educator, speaker, trainer. I'm also the founder of a great camp called the Theodorus Camp. This is all of my contact information below. You can find me on all social media sites. And thank you. Do you have any questions for me if you have any questions for me feel free to unmute your phone i'm gonna get it off um stop the presentation uh mode 
If any of you have questions, please feel free to chime in. And keeping with time. Hi, Parisa. Thank you for that. That was amazing. And hear you, Parisa. You got to speak up. I said thank you for that. That You're was amazing. Mute. No, um, I unmuted. You can't hear me? I just see your lips moving, sweetie. I don't know why I can't hear you. It's unmuted now, but yeah. I don't know. Sorry. I can't. I can't. I'm sorry. It's okay. I just said thank you. I don't think I have it on mute. I took it off presentation mode. She said thank you. She said it was, um, she was happy that you shared okay. it. With the technical difficulties, I'm going to go ahead and start the recording and then you guys can... Danielle, I can't hear you either. I don't know why, but I'm going to stop the recording um, now just for my own peace of mind and technology issues. Stop recording. Yeah.